Hi, hello, welcome, essentially welcome once again on my scientific channel and an educational channel, Discover Social Sciences. And in this video, I am beginning a separate path of educational content. It is a path which I labeled business planning. These videos, this series of videos is designed both for my regular students at the university as a sort of uh, complementary material because in most of my fundamental teaching of economics and management I focus on one basic goal. I want uh, my students to develop their skills in terms of business planning. In short, by the end of their undergraduate studies, I want my students to be able to prepare a decent business plan. And this series of videos entitled Business Planning is specifically targeted at the skills that I want my students to develop. So, after that short introduction, oh, my name. My name is Krzysztof Waśniewski. I'm Polish. I am and I am teaching and doing research at the Andrzej Fritsch Modrzewski University in Kraków, in Poland. So, let's go. I go into my favorite mode of presentation, which is PowerPoint. Uh, here is the opening page of the today's presentation. I allowed myself to put on the front page pictures of two people which I intuitively associate with the concept of like positive change through business. I think that business, when done properly, can truly transform uh, our society, can truly transform our world. And well, it looks like with the climate change and the COVID and this and that, we just have no other way but forward. And forward means that we need to develop new technologies, to develop new things, and business seems necessary in that purpose. So this is business planning hashtag one, number one. Let's sw uh, So let's swing. I go to the second slide to open up. So what do I mean by building a business plan? Uh, I want to be very specific about my take on the thing because there are like many views on the thing and uh, for me, first of all, it is important to assume that a business model and a business strategy are never settled once and for all. Uh, if I prepare a business plan today and if I pitch it to a group of investors, even if I convince them, the situation may change. There could be new technologies, there could be new businesses which entered the market in the meantime before we start. Uh, the macroeconomic environment could change. There is all kinds of things that can happen. There is risk. And business means that we want to manage risks. So, uh, my philosophy in approaching a business plan is that business planning is a process. First of all, it is a process which uh, aims at defining and communicating a business concept in a way which is persuasive enough to convince people to put their resources, mostly their money, into starting and developing a business. Um, and uh, now, like in order to, let's say, clear the field before I go further. In a business plan, in a, go in a good business plan, you don't have, you even shouldn't try to show that you know everything. You should most of all demonstrate that you have done your homework. And if there are risks, you know what those risks are and in the same time, you know what the reward is. Now, basic skills. 
which I want you to develop uh, or which I expect and hope you to develop through that course with me. There are four skills which I define. First of all, using a technique which I call business modeling to fine-tune my business concept. That's the first thing. Of, of course, when I say my business concept, it is about your business concept. Logical. The second skill is doing market research. Uh, market research is something different from what we intuitively associate with it. Because at least I know that my students, when I first uh, drop into the conversation, the concept of market research, they intuitively associate it with polls and questionnaires of all kind. Market research is a little bit complex and in the same time uh, faster and easier than classical polls. The third skill is planning the financials of the business project and finally assessing risks and planning for the contingencies that are attached to those risks. And I start that, uh, let, let's say, the most practical or the more practical part uh, of this particular lecture, of this particular lesson, uh, with a question which I labeled as uncomfortably primal. And the question is, how much money do I need to look for? Why do I categorize that question as uncomfortable? This is simply by experience. I do classes uh, of business planning with my students every year, I have been doing those classes like for the past 10 years or so. And there is like a recurrent pattern in the behavior of my students. When I ask them about their business concept, about an idea, they are comfortable with that. They can easily formulate an idea. But when, they, um, but when I ask, okay, so if this is your idea, how much money would you need to start a business around that idea and possibly to develop that business? And then silence falls. Uh, it is one of those questions which leaves people like a little bit ill at, uh, Ill at ease. How can he ask me so directly how much money do I need? Well, this is one of the first questions that any possible investors will ask you when you present them and try to pitch them a business plan. They will ask you, how much money do you want? How much money do you need? We have money, but we need to know how much. So I uh, want to focus in this video on uh, an answer to that specific question question. So we write business plans in order to convince people that it is worth trying and putting one's resources into our business. In other, way, in other words, a business plan is an elaborate way of communicating and persuading people to do something. And when we ask how much money should I be asking for, the most basic answer is enough money to start the business, develop it and to stay in the game long enough for creating shareholders value. Here I will allow myself to go to the, to the other side, the visual side of the slide. Uh, I mean, picture the cycle. There is money which allows me or any other business person to like get into the starting blocks. Then I start and I run and all that cycle should produce money again, should produce shareholders value and a return on investment. That's the basic logic. And why do I stress this particular point? Because the main mistake uh, that people tend to make when they prepare business plans 
it to be is to be exaggeratedly modest in the amount of money they are looking for so they just want the money like for the first three rents uh, for like most basic equipment and they assume that the rest will somehow take care of itself but this is the wrong approach if you look for investors if you use business plans as a way of communicating with investors you need to give them a guarantee that when they invest they will not lose all their money if you look for too small an amount of money for the needs of your business the risk of losing all the money might be much greater than or as compared to a situation when you asked like for the right sufficient amount of capital to finance everything you needed to finance so there is a fine line between being uh, exaggerately modest and being exaggerately profuse and business planning or skills in business planning precisely serve to feel intuitively and accurately that fine line between exaggerated modesty and profusion in spending money let's go further here is that fundamental concept which i would like you to retain and even to google up uh, or check in a textbook after you watch that video the concept of assets that thing assets things and rights a business needs to start and keep going are called assets you can see that word that term in many concepts for example i discovered watching like action movies that allegedly uh, CIA people use to label their informants as assets. Maybe I don't know their working vocabulary, yet in this context assets mean things and rights that a business needs to start, to start up and to keep going now an important uh, remark for those of you who are not quite familiar with the distinction between things and rights holding enforceable rights to use physical things is at least as valuable business-wise as holding those things in themselves for example uh, when i want to use a factory I might imagine various types of contracts to have the right to use that factory. Whatever contract I sign, what, what matters at the end of the day is precisely my capacity to use that factory. So enforceable rights are most frequently just as valuable or sometimes even more valuable than the physical action to hold and use things. And below I introduce a fundamental distinction between two categories of assets in a business and I want them and I, I would like you to understand that distinction in, a, in sort of a very functional, practical, close to real life manner. So first of all, if you have a business, there are certain things and rights which you just need to be there, to be ready to work, to be at your disposal whenever you want. Most frequently, these things and rights are buildings, or places to do business this is some physical equipment like machines or transportation this can be intellectual property like patents licenses blueprints and this is what you typically need to have in place all the time to keep the business running 
And this category of things and rights is called fixed assets. The concept of fixed is that they stay all the time in your business. Another category of things and rights you need have the property of being sort of fluid and circulating. This is something which I will go more in detail into in my subsequent presentations. But for the moment, I just want to, to have you imagine that, for example, when you run a food store, you need an inventory of food to sort of turn around in the business in order, in order for the business to keep going. If you have a transportation firm with a certain number of trucks uh, driving around for you, you need fuel. You need uh, uh, essentially fuel for those trucks to be continuously powered and burned in those trucks in order to make the business run. And that type of assets can be compared to the bloodstream of your business. It needs to flow. It doesn't need to stay in place. It needs to flow. And those assets are known as current or circulating. Okay. So... Here I return to that point that a business plan serves to convince people it is worth investing in a set of assets. So when you have that question, when you are asked that question, how much money are you looking for, sir or madam, for developing that business, your first answer or the first part of the answer you give is I need enough money to finance this list of assets which you have presented here. So one of the most fundamental steps in business planning is to figure out like the basket of assets which uh, it is optimal to start in the first place and then to keep going your business. That distinction is important uh, because investors are usually cautious. I mean the distinction between starting the business and uh, keeping the business going. Uh, my point is that most investors, including me, would like to put their money into a project progressively as they see progress in operations. For example, my private business is investment in the stock market and I know by experience that the scheme that works the best for me is to invest like constant installments of money every month and sort of learn by observation, learn by experimentation, by trial and error. So, So this is like the psychology of investors. And there is another thing which I develop on in subsequent slides that uh, the kind of assets we need to start a business, all the so-called seed capital, is different from the assets we need to develop a business. There is a distinction between the so-called seed capital and development capital. So what assets do I need to start? Essentially, at the starting point, I need the most elementary technology, which will allow me to supply whatever goods or services I want to supply. And then I need cash. I need cash for like two things or for two different uses. I need cash on the one hand, to face the expenses which I will incur before I break even in my business. So before I reach the break even point. So before I can cover current expenses with current revenue from my clients. Uh, in the next slide, I will explain that concept of breaking even more analytically with the chart. 
Now, uh, the question of cash to face risks. I explain it later too. Anyway, there is that idea that if I don't have enough cash to face unexpected expenses, I have less flexibility. And uh, there is a principle which you can like note down right, down, uh, right now. The greater risk I am facing in my business, the more cash I need to stay flexible in my business decisions. It is something like a general rule that you can remember that in business, finance and in economics, in management, risk is a quantity, is an amount of capital rather than just a likelihood of bad things happening. So now I go into the explanation of what does it mean breaking even in the operations of my business. So here is a story uh, on that chart told over 24 months. You can see it here. Huh? You can see that here you, we have that timeline going. Uh, let me show it how it goes. So it starts on the first month, second month, and so we go over time up to the month 24, okay? Now, the story here is made like of two plots. There is the plot of revenue from my clients. And there is the plot of my current expenses. The current expenses are marked with the blue line. The idea is that at the very beginning of my business, I have no customers at all. I have no customer relations at all. I just need to acquire them progressively. Yet I already have some fixed costs to cover, like the rent, the basic salaries. And that moment, that window in time, uh, when I need to cover those current expenses without having much of a revenue, and the revenue is marked in, uh, in that magenta or slightly orange line. So all those expenses I need to face before my revenues start being really substantial, this is the equivalent of cash I need in the beginning to cover those expenses. To give you an example, it is a real life example of which comes from one of my students in the past years. That student, uh, that student of mine came from uh, like a business family and they had a business uh, which consisted in a chain of stores with paints and generally construction materials. And the, that student told me that his family has a specific strategy to start a new store, to open a new store. They open a new location, they open a new store when they have enough cash saved to cover the, the expenses of that store fully for the first six months. So they make a simulation as if for the first six months of operation, that new store didn't have any sales at all, any revenues at all, and as if all the fixed costs had to be covered like from their own pocket. So this is the amount of cash they prepare before starting that, uh, that, that new store. And then by experience, they know they are relatively safe against all types of contingencies which might ar arise after they start. So here is the idea, I return to the chart, that our customer base and our revenues will build up very progressively. You can see that this line, this orange line is going up very slowly and then suddenly it starts going faster. This is when we like gather speed and in acquiring new customers. And, there, and here comes a point, that point here. 
uh, when the curve of revenues goes over and above the curve of current expenses. And this is the break-even point. This is it. And if you want the surface of that field here, marked with blue arrows, of that field below the uh, uh, below the blue curve of current expenses and above the orange curve of revenues, that field has to be filled with cash, figuratively. That's the idea of breaking even and the idea of preparing cash for the window in time when we will be breaking even. Now I pass to the concept of cash understood as flexibility. I chose a picture of that mouse in a helmet uh, facing a mouse trap. The idea is cheese is attractive. You would say that it is stupid for that mouse to go into that trap just for cheese, but if the alternative was to starve to death, going for that cheese might be worth taking a risk at the condition that we can manage the risk. So at the condition that, metaphorically speaking, the mouse can put on a helmet. That helmet costs money. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a technology. So this is the idea that some risks in business are, are worth taking. And it is important to know that your investors will be even expecting from you to take those risks. You just need to know how much money, how much capital you need to prepare for those risks and to, for taking them or facing them in an informed, rational way. So now from the question of how or what kind of assets do I need to start, I, part to a, I, I pass to the broader question, how much money or what kind of assets do I need to keep going with my business? And I made like two structures, my seed assets, so the assets that I start my business with, and the assets for development, so those which I will need subsequently after I, uh, af after I have broken even. And to, broadly speaking, we can assume I will return here to the graph of breaking even. Essentially, we can assume that this point of breaking even is the transition between starting a business and developing it. Up to this point, it is all startup. Past this point, so when revenues are greater than expenses and when I have operational profit in my business, so here, past that point of breaking even, it is development. Okay, now I return to that slide with a map of my two baskets of assets for seed and starting and then for developing. So initially I have some basic technology which allows me just to make and supply whatever I want to make and supply. And the logical path of development is then to invest into even more technology. So I use the same picture of an electric turbine uh, just uh, no, it is a picture I think of a jet engine and uh, here I just made it bigger. Now the cash that you need for staying flexible. So the cash which serves you to be that mouse well prepared for going into that trap for grabbing the piece of cheese. That amount of cash essentially depends on your market, on the market in environment. You never really know, you have to feel it. There are no like clear rules. In subsequent videos, I will try to present you some like uh, heuristics for calculating that amount of cash, but it's very largely an amount of uh, question of experience. So 
that amount of cash depends on the market and you just need to adapt and finally from the initial amount of cash that you needed for getting up to the break-even point you pass to three distinct categories of circulating assets in your business first of all you pass to receivables receivables are essentially money frozen in customer relations when you sell something to someone and you grant them an extended delay for payment for example if you give them 14 days for payment it is as if you were crediting your customers and these are precisely receivables in some businesses for example in the advertising business those receivables can grow huge they might be the most important assets in your capital base on the long run then you have in inventories if needed for example if you run a factory you will need important inventories if you run i don't know a software company your in inventories will be essentially symbolic and and negligible and then you stay with some residual necessary cash for current expenses okay so partial summary a business plan is a conceptual and presentational tool which serves to convince people they should put capital into a business one of the most fundamental questions to answer in a business plan is how much money do i need to look for and the essential answer is I need as much money as I need to finance the assets I need, which means to finance things and rights uh, required to start operating a technology, then to go through the first tough period before breaking even, to finance the risks I need to accept for staying flexible, and finally to develop my business past the break even point. Okay, so that's all in this presentation. I hope it was maybe useful, maybe interesting. Uh, I hope you will follow in subsequent videos and you can feel free to explore my channel for other educational videos. So now, as usually uh, uh, at the end of each of my videos, I wish all my viewers and all my students to have fun with science and to have fun with life. Bye.